Sarah, thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's lovely to be back at the ISA annual conference. I'm literally in a slightly different role from where what I was in my the, the previous time I was here. Um, yeah, so information, knowledge, and wisdom. Eastbourne is a funny place to come mountain climbing, but that's what I want to do over the next 45, 50 minutes. We'll see how it goes. I want to start in base camp and talk about data, and that, as Sarah says, allows me to wear my sort of geeky hat or baseball cap, I suppose, a little um, to start with, and then think beyond that to information and how we deal with the vast amount of information that we have at our fingertips and how we equip our pupils to cope with the flood of information that they're going to face as they grow up. And then move beyond that to think about knowledge, which allows us to think a little about a knowledge-based curriculum and core knowledge, which is where the Secretary of State is taking the maintained sector. Your mileage may well vary. And then finally, to round off and think about themes like resilience and themes like personal and professional growth, as we talk a little about wisdom there at the end. Okay, so the whole data thing, we're thinking in terms of the numbers here, we're thinking in terms of words, we're thinking in terms of characters, we are thinking of course, now in terms of bits and how that has radically changed over the, my lifetime. Um, who's familiar with Moore's Law? Okay, that's not enough of you. Okay, fundamental principle, well, kind of fundamental. Certainly, it seems to be the case that when we look at technology, you plot this on a logarithmic graph and you find the speeds of the processes in your devices, in your phones, in your computers get twice as fast every couple of years or so. The phone you've got in your pocket now, roughly, was they're going to be about 32 times as powerful as the one which you had 10 years ago. Roughly a thousand times as, the, as powerful as the one which you had 20 years ago. And we think that's going to carry on into the future. The phone with which one of your pupils leaves school, if they're in reception at the moment, what's that going to be? That's going to be 128 times as powerful as the one which you're not allowing them to bring into school at the moment. And there are huge implications for that, yeah? And preparing children for a future in which that technology continues to accelerate its growth. There's a corollary to Moore's Law, which is the less known Crider's Law, which says the same thing applies when we look at storage capacity. It's not just the speed of the device which doubles every couple of years. If you look at the storage capacity, that's doubling even faster. We're looking at a graph which is about 18 months for the doubling there. And if you think about the implications of that, of what you can store on your mobile phone, 64 gigabyte memory on the device in your pocket, compare that to the BBC Micro that I had when I was growing up 20 years ago now, 32k of memory, that's 2 million times the storage capacity that we had back then. And that's a stark statistic. Let's just put that into some perspective here. Up at the top there, you've got an illustration of what Wikipedia would look like if we printed it out on paper. We took just the text of the English Wikipedia and printed all of that out. We're looking at 1,700 volumes, nine big bookcases full of data. You can fit that and spare onto a little micro SD card, which is smaller than your thumb already. And the implications, again, of that. One of the implications of that is this storage capacity, you know, okay, we have a little bit of spare space on our hard disk. But if you apply this worldwide and think about the way we're using this storage capacity that doubles every year and a half or so, the, one of the implications is that we've kind of stored as much data in the last year and a half. What's that now, November 2011, folks? So since November 2011, we as a species have stored as much data as the whole of human history up to that. That is scary. Admittedly, most of the stuff we've stored over the last year and a half has been videos of the cats, cats playing the piano on YouTube, but that's another matter. So in one minute on the internet, and this data is already out of date. We have one and a half, 1.3 million videos being watched on YouTube. We have 30, I think this current statistic is closer to 72 hours of video being uploaded in any one minute on the internet. We have six new Wikipedia articles, so that graph is already out of date. This huge amount of data. 
And that's stored in big data centers like that. And it's nice to see Google looking after our data so very, very well there. What are they doing with that? Are they just looking after that for our sake? Well, they're doing clever things with that data. Every time you do something online, every time you use your mobile phone to access the internet, every time you use your computer to access the internet from school, that leaves a trail of information. And clever, clever people at Google and elsewhere are doing clever, clever things with that data. How many of the children in your school are aware of this data trail that they generate every time they do something like that? I'd like you to talk to the folks around your table, if you would, please, and talk about all of the data that your school or the systems that it uses stores about any individual people. A couple of minutes ago, how much, what data are you collecting on each of the children in your school, even if you're not using it? Okay, can I draw your conversations back together, please? So, answers from the room. What have you got there? Anybody want to volunteer something from your table? Medical data. Okay. And that's... Give me an example of the sort of thing. Okay, lovely. What else? Okay. Yes. Anybody using, what is it called, Class Dojo? It's a lovely little tool. Put it on the interactive whiteboard. Every time the child work, behaves well, behaves badly, little badge added to their little character up on the whiteboard there. All of that data being stored, able to be analyzed. Targets, thank you. Of course. Oh, yes. <laughs> Other things? Yeah, absolutely, the demographics, where they live, dates of birth, sorry? Exams, okay, we've got assessments, I can put it with assessments, can't I? Yes, that's where it gets more interesting. This stuff is largely standard, I'd say. But if you move to the virtual learning environment, they're doing their work online. They're doing their work online. And all of the interactions with that system being stored somewhere into the server logs of your virtual learning environment, Moodle, Frontier, Frog, whatever. All of that's there. Anybody in the group said library records? Every group that the child checks out of the library? Anybody got um, um, IDs for school lunches? Okay, everything which they eat at lunch? Yes. Okay, you've also, I mean, you've got attendance records and you've got all of that there. Anybody, well, I should imagine you're all using filtering proxy servers to get out to the internet. Yeah? Every web page that the child visits from school? Yeah. All of the, the text of all of the emails that they send. We're crossing into territory where it feels as though we're looking inside their tuck boxes. Now, doesn't it? When you get to that. But think of what somebody like Google, what somebody like Sainsbury's, what somebody like Barclay could do if they got their hands on that data. Think of the early interventions that might be possible once we start mining that sort of data. Yeah? This child's not logged on to our virtual learning environment in the last three or four days. Is that time for their form teacher to go and have a quiet word? Oh, you are. Yeah? This child is looking at slightly interesting, dodgy, significant, Websites, is that something where a report ought to be generated and somebody intervenes and puts that child back on track? That's what Sainsbury's could do. That's probably what Barclay Park could do. Google could do that if they want to, I'm sure. So, yeah, we have, I mean, this is a classic cartoon, isn't it? 1993, the very, very early days of the web. The web had been around for a couple of years, and all of that freedom because we were at the Wild West frontier. On the internet, you're a dog. Yeah? It's not like that anymore. It's the internet. Of course they know you're a dog. 
They also know your favorite chew toy, pet food, how many times a day you go for a walk, and the name of the poodle at the park you keep sending roses to. <laughs> that data trail is generated. What you do with that is the interesting thing. And I'm not sure as this is a particularly good example of this. So Ipsos Mori offering the text and call records of 27 mobile phone users for sale. And one of their customers, of course, the police. And of course, they're not breaking data protection laws because they're aggregating it together. They're going to give you phone records of 50 people who happen to be in this area at the time, not individuals. But think of the implications of that and think about how to prepare children for that. So yeah, the predictive analytics stuff that I'm talking about, doing clever things with that data. Lovely stories from, you know, in the New York Times magazine about the teenage girl who keeps being sent batches for baby food and nappies and so on. And father, incensed about that, goes to the store and complains about that. Says, why are you sending my daughter all of these things? She's a teenager. Why should she be interested in all of this stuff about babies? Has a conversation with his daughter. He turns to his daughter, apologizes that there are things happening in his household he hadn't been aware of. But by looking at her purchase history, the supermarket that's the power of some of this analytics. And scary, potentially very powerful. There are things you can do with this data yourself. You know, talk to the geeks on your staff about this, about what you could do by mining some of this data. Don't feel you have to sort of buy in services to do this. The NFER reporting back in 2005, a long time ago now, that actually the systems that school developed themselves seem to fit better. So examples from my own work here. You know, we use Moodle as our virtual learning environment at Roehampton. I'm not going to apologize for it. It's the way it is. Um, you know, the logs that that generates of when our trainees go online, what they access, what they look at, when they submit their assignments. We're not doing anything particularly interesting with that data, but there are interesting things you could do. This was back in 2005, 2006, when I was deputy head of St. in Hazelmere. We introduced the virtual learning environment thing and did it in a sort of randomized control trial sort of way. But let's see how it compares when we introduced this to what happened before we introduced this. And it does shift the training time ever so slightly. Regrettably, not a statistically significant result overall. But then when you look at the log files and compare the residuals there that are bubble below the trend line to what they're actually doing with the virtual you find that those who are using it more strategically, those who are looking back over old quizzes or old resources, those who are actually contributing more actively were the ones who got the real benefit from using that system, irrespective of where they came in the ability range. And there's nothing more sophisticated than Excel powering that sort of analysis. With my own trainees, at the moment, we get them all blogging and writing about know, what they're doing on placement and what they're doing with us in the lecture room. And, you know, a million words generated. That's a huge amount of data that we could do some really interesting things with. All I've got there is a relatively uninteresting tag cloud of all of those millions of work, million words. Isn't it lovely that the next generation of teachers, when they're writing about what they're learning, that children are right at the center of that. That's the word that comes up more than any other. And think is a nice one to see up there, too, I think. And then you can look at the social network analysis. Who are they friends with? Now, this is like gold dust from Facebook's point of view. They won't let you see these social graphs. But this is the thing which parallels Facebook. And isn't it also one of the reasons why parents opt into the independent system, so that they choose the circle of friends with whom their children are going to be with? So this is very simple social network analysis of those blog posts and who comments on who. We don't actually refer to trainees by number. Sorry, it's not coming up particularly clearly at this range. But some of these are really very, very well connected. I'm sure you can think in your school who would be that person at the center of all of those lines as being very social, commenting on all of their friends' posts, lots of people commenting on their posts. But I'm more worried about trainee 89 here as to how come this trainee only commented on one other blog post, nobody commented on what he, she wrote. If I had that data earlier on, on the end of the year when I did the analysis, isn't that cause for an early intervention? Say, so what's going on? How are things going? 
so I think I can do some help. And that sort of analysis for the data that you're generating or your systems are generating in school. Okay, I want to move on then to think a little more about information rather than just data. And there is a view that we are essentially, information lies at the heart of who we are as a species. That what we do is to pass on the genetic information to the next generation. It's not just as a species, this is pretty much all living things, isn't it? It's about passing on the information that's coded in our genes to a very, very naturalistic level. I think we can go beyond that and start thinking about what Dawkins calls means, passing on ideas rather than just genetic information. And we as a species have evolved a particularly effective way of doing that. And of course, I'm talking about language here. Okay, with one or two possible exceptions. It is our defining characteristic that we no longer, or that we as a species, don't just learn from our own experience, from what we do. We try it, that we have the chance to make up something, draw on other people's experience there too, by listening to them, by talking about them. This, of course, is a great opportunity for that. You know what that thing is, do you? The conversations you'll have over lunch, over dinner, out on the beach, <laughs> okay? That's where you can borrow the experience and the practice from others, and we do that through the medium of language. But of course, we then figured out uh, language 50,000 years, 100,000 years, something of that order, depending on who you believe. It's hard to get a record of that because it took a while before we started keeping a record of the language stuff. But because of writing, we no longer have to be in the same place at the same time. In cultures, societies that haven't developed writing, that are passing on information nearly, nearly, through an oral tradition. For them, I'm told, it's magical. They see somebody write something down and pass that to somebody else, and the idea travels that way without anybody having to say anything. And this, I think, is why the Secretary of State is so right on this occasion. Okay, go to my Hamilton Press <laughs> to focus on the importance of reading. But because of that, because of our ability to use the written form, of the language. We've got access to all of the stuff that was written down 6,000 years ago. Well, okay, if you can read cuneiform 6,000 years ago or thereabouts, more recently, perhaps. And then, of course, the next great innovation is the ability to do that at a massive scale through the invention of printing in the 15th, 16th, 16th, 15th century, of being able to take one piece of writing and share that with a huge number of people, which otherwise would not have been possible. Where do we go from there? Well, there are lots of in inventions in between, but I think the one that immediately stands out for me, Geekat, perhaps, is Berners-Lee's invention of the web. And, you know, if you look back at the history of this, it, 20 years after the start of the internet, internet roughly about 1969, but nobody, like, people were using it for, like, transferring files or doing emails or things. It was... Berners-Lee's invention of the web using the technology of the internet, which made it something for all of us. And of course, he did that as a way of managing, sharing, passing on the information which the rest of the team at CERN were creating, were storing, so that the connections between these ideas became something which was far, far easier to follow than it would have been through even using the printed word. Where next? I don't know. Is a smartphone as exciting as the web? Probably not. But the fact that I've got access to all of that stuff on the web, wherever, whenever I want to, my magic thumbs here, that by moving my thumbs in a certain sort of way, I perform an incantation which can find out for me pretty much any fact, any single bit of information. So that's all there in my pocket and my fingertips if the Wi-Fi is working or the 3G connection is working. And that's radically transformative. So, you know, forgive me, teacher trainer here. Um, who remembers Piaget from their teacher training days? Excellent. You've tried to forget, I'm sure. Okay? We have 
constructivism. This notion, Piaget, you remember perhaps, his early training was as a biologist, and he looked at his own children and saw them through his own eyes as lone scientists, as performing experiments, and, and learning through direct experience of manipulating objects and doing things. And that's how they form their understanding of how the world around them works, which is fine. We can do that. But then we go on to this idea of social constructivism. And Vygotsky, anybody recognize Vygotsky's picture in the room? Well done. Okay, any Roehampton alumni in the room? Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. okay. So we have this notion that it's not just learning through experience and experiment, lovely as that all is, but actually at the heart of the learning process is the conversation, is the language side of things. We pass on ideas to one another, we get ideas from one another. And Vygotsky goes further and says, actually, the encoding of that is through the process of language, it is through writing that as language in your head, if you will. I'm not the only person who has that little internal voice when I describe things that happen and create that narrative, am I? Okay. I'm really worrying. I'm really worrying. Okay. We go a stage further, and we have uh, Stephen Downs, George Siemens here, who've come up with what they call connectivism, a learning theory for the digital age that actually they see learning at its heart as about making connections. Can you actually say that the children in your class or in your teacher's class have learnt something if their brains aren't physically different at the end of the lesson than they were at the beginning? If the connections between the neurons aren't either stronger or present where they were previously absent? So we talk a lot about creative teaching at Roehampton, and the notion of creativity in teaching is, I think, an interesting one, because I don't think you can say it's creative unless you're making something. So what are my trainees making? What are your teachers making? Well, they're making connections between the neurons in the children's head, where they're strengthening the ones that are out there. Go away from the term teacher. Call it applied neuroengineering or something. It's got a rather nice ring to it. So yeah, for, and, and there's more to it than just the neurological level. But for Downs and Siemens, it's about connecting the ideas together, learning the bits of information on their own, the bits of information on their own, isn't enough. It's fitting them into a network of interrelated ideas and connecting the ideas together. So of course you need knowledge, which we'll come to, but it's the ability to fit new bits of knowledge, new bits of information into that network where things matter. Our ability to learn what we need for tomorrow is more important than what we know today. I wonder. So yeah, I think we are now at the point where you can pretty much teach yourself anything, almost anything, as long as you're literate. You've got to be able to read to do this. You've got to be connected, ideally to the internet, to the web, so you've got access to all of that, but at least connected to other people. You've also got to have the motivation there, and that, I think, is the role, the, the key role the school is to give children that desire to teach themselves these things, to learn more. And you've got to have the time. And there's a role there for school too. The same, of course, applies to your teachers and to your, your, you yourselves. You've got the literate. You've got the connected. I hope you and they have the motivation. But how often do we actually have the time to teach ourselves that? I say almost anything. Um, many, many things. I'm still holding out on dentistry. I'd like my dentist not to be entirely self-taught. I'm sure there are other <laughs> examples too. How are we doing? Time for another of these brief exercises, talk amongst your friends. Could you, for me, please, think about where the children that you teach or that your teachers teach go to for information? Where do they go to find out new things, to learn new things? <coughs> Okay, let's have a list then. <laughs> Answers from the floor. In your own time, don't all rush at once. YouTube. YouTube, excellent, yeah. Okay. Google, of course. Just out of interest, is there anybody in the room who's not using Google as their search engine of choice? Interesting. What are you using on your iPad? Just... Okay. Yeah, but what search engine would you use through Safari? Oh, I see. Um, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. It's the big G again. 
Yeah. Never since the Reformation has one organization controlled quite so many people's access to information. We trust them. They say they're not evil. That's okay. <laughs> but, uh, Wikipedia, very good. Um, of course, most of it's made up. But on the other hand, the rest of it's all made up as well, isn't it? What else have we got? Twitter. You're all thinking, you're, I'm projecting here. You know, this is all very, very geeky, folks. Uh, blogs, forums. Sorry? Each other. Each other. Thank you. Like that. Oh, eventually, library, books. Somebody just called out a radical idea here about teachers. That's, it's, it's nice to see that eventually, what's that point nine on the list we get down to teachers, that they have their place. <laughs> Do we have other answers? Library. Library of the web. Oh, right. So sort of curated collection. Not the whole of the web. The, ones, the, the bit of the web that we think. Yeah. Google is not always the quickest way there. Parents. That's good. Is that museums? Nice. So. Yeah, virtual learning environment. Okay, I've run out of space. I could create some more space. But that's a, that's a pretty good list. It's a pretty good list. I've prepared one or two pictures for you. Classrooms? Yeah, teachers you have. Yeah, this is my former colleague, Andy Walker. Lovely, lovely classroom. What's going on there? He's very much in charge of the activities that are taking place in that space. They're all learning things together. We're moving to a social constructivist perspective here. Together as a class, we're constructing our knowledge, our need. This set of activities is providing experiences through which we believe learning happens. And I think knowing Andy, they would have been learning things. Lots of resources there. But very much a focused activity, very much him providing the motivation and the time. This is Roehampton's library, or part of Roehampton's library, and that's a place, of course, where you go, where you go to find out things. And back when I was training, that was the only place you went to find out. I have an observation in response to your earlier question, Mark. So I think many of my students go to all of those things that you listed for information, but very often they have to go to teachers for the understanding. Yes. Uh, yes. Coming back to I that, think we may get to that, yes. Yeah. 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 I, I think that the, um, as you get much older, you develop the ability to create your own understanding. But even at the sixth form level that all of my students are at, I think they are very often going to those wise people who will turn that amorphous mass of information yeah. into something which has meaning. This is it. It's, the information is easy to get to now. It's fitting it into the structure which is still requires the work, bringing order out of the chaos, reducing entropy. That's the thing I learned before. And the library catalog kind of does that for you. But you're still dealing with individual bits of information, bites of information, that are relevant to the thing that you're looking for. Fitting them into the overarching vision is something else. So yeah, we, there's plenty of opportunity for this on, on your own, this is my study back at Alton, but you know, those of you who are working in a boarding environment, they all have their own personal space. Those of you who are not working in a boarding environment, how much of a child's learning happens in that space at home? And the significant thing now isn't so much the books, it is the connection out to the web, because of course, this is the place that we go to find things out. If there's some, you know, a bit of information that I want to find out, I will naturally Google it. And using that is fine. And the digital literacy and the digital skills are something which we could expect them to have. But how many of them, how many of us have that understanding about how that works, about how the pages are put into order, about how it knows that the Independent Schools Council homepage is the number one thing that I should be looking at there. That that, how is that chosen? And you'll notice that number two is independent schools in Godalming, which happens to be the place that I live. Number four is Charterhouse, which is obviously leading public school in Godalming. So Google knows who it is who's looking, knows where I am, and it's giving me the search results which it thinks are best for me. Does anybody in the room know how Google chooses what to put top of the list? Got Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And then below that, how's it making it easy? 
Oh, Tomu jsi finance. You've got to have the word on the page. That matters. Yeah? If you're searching for independent schools and the page doesn't mention independent schools, it's unlikely to make it profitable. Yes. Could have been recommendations by actually They're very clever and they know what the algorithm is and will thus try and skew things. Yeah, but how do they do that? You used to be able to get away with it. Back in the days of Ultimate, did anybody else remember Ultimate Scan? <laughs> you could get away with that. With Google, it's the, the, the kind of, it's kind of very, very clever people. The algorithm, or at least the core of the algorithms out there in the public domain, here you go, folks, if you'd like to just copy that down. <laughs> it's called PageRank, named after Larry Page, who's one of Google's founders. And broadly speaking, the top page in the search results is the one which has the highest number high quality inbound links. I don't know the quality of the page or something that has a high page rank. So it's a self-reversing formula. So the number of websites that point to your school website, the higher up the Google search engine ranking you'll go. And if you've got good quality sites pointing to your school website, higher still. So Independent Schools Council obviously doing jolly well. And of course, they go to Facebook. Our trainees are using Facebook so much in space which we're not present as lecturers. And they're using that to swap stories about what happens in school. They're using that to swap stories about what happens in lectures. They're using that to swap ideas for assignments and ideas for lesson plans. And at the moment, our third years and PGCEs, ideas for how to do interviews. And that's great because it is about the connections. Again, Tobin writing back in 98, Building your own personal learning network, the group of people who can guide your learning, point you to learning opportunities, answer your questions, and give you the benefit of their own knowledge and experience is more important now than it has ever been. Of course we use Google, but we also use Twitter and Facebook to find these things out. We also talk to the people we trust about these things. And I'm sure you have many of the nodes in your personal learning network sat around these tables today. The network thing is really, really interesting. I think to return to the point which we were addressing, your information is the nodes here. Yeah? I guess that one up at the top right, that's just a little bit of data that doesn't even fit into any sort of schema. But the information is the nodes. The knowledge is the connections between those nodes. And so I've cited down to the and to say that our job as teachers is about letting them make the connections between these bits of information. And understanding and wisdom, if you'll allow me, is an emergent property of this network. It's something, once you have the network there, the wisdom and the understanding emerges from that. And the same is true at school level. Yeah? Your teachers, your children, they can do the information thing. It's when you connect them together and start with them in the classroom that the knowledge truly begins to emerge. And perhaps the wisdom and the understanding is an emergent property of that network. I don't know, maybe. Um, which takes us on to knowledge. Isn't this a lovely picture? Um, what is this sort of medieval um, German lecture room? We've got somebody on the right hand side who's having trouble looking at his black screen, I guess. We've got an interesting conversation happening at the right there. There are one or two people who appear to be listening to the chat sat on the dais. You know what presentations can be like where it's just one person standing. Uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. Um, so, yeah, again, foundational work for a lot of the work I've done around information management in school. But the foundation of the information society is knowledge, and that's the foundation for all education and for all culture. And again, thinking of knowledge as the connection between these bits of information. And I think this is where the Secretary of State some of the time is taking us, or taking the maintained sector. But if you look at the draft of the new national curriculum, he says that the aims of this document, this new national curriculum, is to provide people with an introduction to the core knowledge that they need to be educated citizens, introduces people to the best that has been thought and said, and helps engender an appreciation for human creativity and achievement. So something which is so focused on acquiring knowledge. And I do like this bit about the best that has been thought and said. Sorry? Well, there are people wearing suits, sat in conference rooms inside your buildings. Who else would decide 
or if you believe some of the stories, for at least half of the history for instance, you start in South Africa, we come from the back of London. Is there a key word understanding this um, I think actually I've copied and pasted that bit. They have to use Control C and Control V. Do you read from the original document? Well, I just think you can see that without the word understanding. Yeah. Um, focusing on knowledge, we'll take this so far. But maybe in our sort of schools, and maybe one or two other schools too, we ought to be looking beyond mere knowledge to something which is approaching wisdom, to something where it's, just, it's not just about knowing stuff, it's about having the courage to make a difference to things, and having that sense of how it fits into it all, all around it, which will never be a moral purpose to it. So yeah, I think it, it takes us so far, but there may be further room to travel beyond that. Um, anybody using this? Civitas Cultural Literacy, or what is it, Core Knowledge Curriculum? Okay, Google it, click on the link. I just wanted to check first before I said anything too controversial about it. It's a long list. And E.D. Hirsch is very, very influential in terms of where the Secretary of State has taken this with the draft of the national curriculum. And this notion of there is this body of knowledge which a child should acquire and what they should know by the time they move on from year two into year three is close to where we're going with the new national curriculum in terms of lists of. I want to say facts, and it, it feels like that if you have a look at some of the things which E.D. Hirsch has written. And of course, lying at the back of this are really deep philosophical questions about what do we mean by knowledge? Is it something which is merely there through our collected experience or even our individual experience? Is it something which you can do starting from almost nothing through the process of exercising reason? Or is it something which is contingent, which is determined by the community, by the society in which you sit? Where do you stand as a school? What's your school policy on epistemology? Anybody? What do you see knowledge as? Not yet a policy document which ISI require you to have. Um, we, we, we miss out in English because we use the word to know or to know for two separate things which German preserves as, as separate language here. We have this distinction between knowing that and knowing how. So you have a huge body of knowledge in your staff and in your pupils about things that they know about, things that they know. So that's explicit, that's something which we can document, that's something which we codify, that's something which we could put into a policy document. Your teacher's subject knowledge is very much on that side of the diagram. The test scores, the assessment, the exams that we were talking about earlier, we were talking about data tracking, is there. The outcomes from the education process is certainly there on that, knowing that side. And there's also a slightly fuzzy side of the table, isn't there? You know how to do something. It's much harder to get your hands on that. It's much harder to get a teacher to tell you about how about, about all of these things, but how they teach them. Getting that information, that's a much harder thing to capture and to identify. You know, their approach to teaching, their, this tacit knowledge and the process that happens inside the classroom rather than merely the outcome of that. David Hargreaves, who was Professor of Education in my day when I was doing my PGC, says that the challenge for knowledge management in education is how you get into the teacher's heads there, how you externalise their insights, the ones that are locked in their head, the heads of individual teachers and protected by the privacy of their classroom. And I think we've got better at that since 2002. But you've all got, I'm sure, members of staff who, when they eventually are allowed to retire, they're going to be really, really hard people to replace because of that tacit feel, rather than knowledge, perhaps, of how this happens inside the classroom. OK, I'm conscious of time passing. Um, one to talk about over lunch, I think, rather than to necessarily spend time on now, but do you have systems for that? Do you have ways of capturing at least some of that knowledge? And do you have ways of sharing that amongst the staff in your school? And what are your approaches to developing your teacher's knowledge? And one of the, the key ideas for me here is, is um, Seymour Papert, one of the great pioneers of computing education, recognizing that the Piaget stuff and the Vygotsky stuff takes you some way, but actually this stuff happens really well 
when you start making things for other people to see, putting together a presentation, putting together your school prospectus, believe it or not, putting together your ISI documentation. When you go through that process of actually coded by it, creating a knowledge artifact, as he called it, for other people to see, that's where so much of that building those networks of connections really does happen. Talking about it is fine, but making something is more powerful still. And of course, children are doing this not quite all of the time, but much of the time. UGC, TLA, anybody? User-generated content. Uh, Demos writing back in 2007, digitizing their creative efforts, this generation of young people can share the fruits of their labor with a worldwide audience. They can post videos, upload, upload photos, and link back to their friends. They're connecting, exchanging, and creating in a new way. The people they were writing about back in 2007, six years on, some of them are now entering the teaching profession. Some of your NQTs are very, very familiar with this technology, not just your NQTs. You know, middle-aged men can do this sort of thing too. It speaks from experience here. You know? That by making these things to show to others, that's where so much of the knowledge um, creation work happens. And again, David Hargreaves talking about tinkering teachers. You've all, I'm sure, got colleagues who are doing interesting, cool, exciting, slightly risky sorts of things in their classroom. Passing that on to others is where you move from their being merely creative teachers to their being innovators, to your school being an innovative place that shares its expertise with others. Diana Lorillard writes about this very, very eloquently in teaching as a design science. Think of it as teaching as a craft, which would please the Secretary of State. Build, that we as teachers build on the work of others. We share our practice and what we achieve with others. And we've got a language and a space in which to do this. And again, thinking in terms of creating knowledge inside the school, inside the classroom. Lovely, interesting work going on now. Ben Goldacre, commissioned by the Secretary of State, to talk about how we can move education to a more evidence-based profession. And the director of the School of Education down at Roehampton, it's a profession without a body of knowledge. The, how you teach is something which isn't there as clear as it is for a doctor of how you treat a patient. There's a very clear understanding of what a doctor should do, of what a lawyer should do. For teaching, it's much more, well, I think this is going to work. And Ben Goldacre and others saying that we meet, need to move to a slightly more sort of rigorous, evidence-informed approach to this. And lovely work from um, the Education Endowment Foundation of ways of doing that. And I encourage you to download the, the, the DIY evaluation guide there and set up some of these randomized control trials in your school. John Hattie writing about visible learning, an amazing book. This needs to be on your staff room bookshelf. You know, 800 meta-analyses of rigorous before and after type academic studies. He's looked at not the original studies, but the analyses of these studies, pulled it all together, and you know, in one, in one sentence, the biggest effects on student learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching, when students become their own teachers. Okay, there may be more to it than that, but as a rule of thumb, it's not bad. And this hasn't worked. I'm not going to spend time on it now. There's, the book is, is long and rigorous and academic. If you go to EF Toolkit, EFF Toolkit rather, um, then you've, no, EF Toolkit, I was right in the title, Education Endowment Foundation, they've done the summary table of that where they show you these are the key things. These are the ones which cost least money and have most effect. And some surprising findings. Okay, finally, on to wisdom then. And we have this idea of the digital native, don't we? Let me see if I can track this back to the beginning. Who's seen the baby iPad video before? You're in for a treat, the rest of you. Okay. Audio with a bit of luck. Oh, don't you just hate it when technology doesn't work. She's doing it with her hand. Doesn't scroll. <gasps> Still not working. This page is interactive. Just can't click on it. My fingers work. 
It's just the magazine that's not. Not in that. Okay, she didn't come out of the womb believing that's how people do it. I don't care. But it's such a fundamental part of her earliest experience that that is her expectation for how the world will respond to her. You know, this is pre language, isn't it? She expects the world to react to her like that. So, you know, if we're willing to accept the term digital native, then I think she is one. But Prensky, come on, there you go. Prensky is the man who coined this term digital native a number of years ago now. And you know, tweets last week, not all digital natives know how to use the technology well. And that is certainly true if you think about all of the children in your school. But almost all see technology as a fundamental part of their 21st century life. This is where you know, teaching is about meeting them where they are. And for many, many, Almost all of your pupils, this is kind of where they are. Prensky goes on to suggest what we can do as teachers, and I think this is the beginnings of wisdom, about us as teachers, let them bring all of this expertise and confidence, but then we add on top of that a layer of understanding of wisdom, if you want, about asking the right questions, about guiding them in the right way to do this, and using this in a moral way. Way. Putting the material in context, making those more connections for them, and creating the rigor and ensuring the quality. And I think that's helpful. Um, I don't know about this, but Ben Hammersley, who's Prime Minister's advisor to Tech City or some such, how to interact with the digital world is an ongoing challenge. The first and second generation, me too, have moved from excited first contact with the basics of a networked environment. Who remembers the first time they went on the internet? Wasn't it amazing? With the, via exhilarating immersion in its complexity, to increasingly a pared back simplicity in their internet usage that allows them to live harmoniously with and on the new platform. Now, I'm not sure. I think he may be overly confident there. I think there are many, many of our pupils, your pupils, are very much at the exhilarating immersion in its complexity stage. But it's hopeful, isn't it, that we're going to move beyond that to not just be all of this stuff, to actually thinking about what's the right way of doing this, a simpler approach to these things. A more zen approach is the way he would put it. And okay, you've got one of those, if you've got GCSEs going on at the moment, soon you'll have one of those pinned to your school gym, won't you? Don't bring your mobile phone in here. Because that's a time when you have to be on your own, when you have to do it in an isolated way. And we were asked to turn down, possibly even turn off our mobile phones today. Perhaps there's the space, perhaps part of what Hammersley is talking about here is stopping using the technology, is having the privileged time when we don't connect to the web, when we focus back again on the people with whom we are present. Now, how many of your homes do you have children texting using their phones at the meal table? I hope not looking around the room, but I bet it happens that this is a special time when we're together as a family. Isn't it appalling that the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden have to put in their programme, please do not text whilst people are singing? <laughs> Surely there ought to be spaces and times when we focus on being physically present and mentally present with the people with whom we are present, rather than this connected thing. So yeah, take the time out, and you know, the TMI, too much information, 
that you go for the walk on Exmoor and leave the Blackberry, nobody uses Blackberries anymore, leave the iPhone at home and just focus on you know, being there in the world. And I think that's where we move from knowledge, all of this information, to wisdom about saying actually there's a time when we don't want to do this. So, those of you who followed the, the coverage in the press, the Secretary of State at Brighton College, just down the road last week, what is, the speech is titled, What Does It Mean to Be an Educated Person? And regrettably, it doesn't answer the question. But it does give us some insights. Parents, oh, sorry, I think I might have made a mistake with the copying and pasting here. Parents want their children to be happy, fulfilled, and successful through the development of their natural curiosity, talents, and potential. So what makes children happier by introducing them to levels of accomplishment that they may never have envisaged? I think he's probably speaking right on this, not necessarily on everything, yeah? But it's about broadening horizons, isn't it? And about allowing them to connect more nodes into that network. And this, the Education Act back in 2002 enshrined this. You look at the aims for the new national curriculum and you're right, it's very much focused on that core knowledge of passing on the best of the past. But the statutory requirements for any maintained school's curriculum, and it applies to your nurseries if you're accepting <coughs> vouchers, the curriculum for a maintained school and maintained nursery school satisfies the requirements of the section. It's a balanced and broadly based curriculum, promotes the spiritual, moral, cultural, mental, and physical development of pupils at the school and of society, and prepares pupils at the school for the opportunities, responsibilities, and experiences of later life. And this is looking to the future. This is about ensuring their development, our development as a society. And I wonder how many maintained schools are in promoting the physical development of society. That's another matter. And preparing pupils for all of the opportunities which they'll have in later life. And some of the stuff I was talking about earlier has implications for that too, those opportunities for later life. So, you know, what does it mean to be an educated person? R.S. Peters writing back in, the 1970, back in 1970, our concept of an educated person Someone who's capable of delighting in a variety of pursuits and projects for their own sake, and whose pursuit of them and general conduct of life is transformed by a degree of all-round understanding and sensitivity. I think this is taking us beyond knowledge to wisdom or to understanding. Perhaps. And yeah, the National Curriculum quotes Matthew Arnold, 1869, writing in Culture and Anarchy about this. What is it? Um, the best which has been thought and said in the world. And that's lovely, it really is. And let us pass on the best that's been thought and said. But Arnold goes further. He's through this knowledge, turning a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits, which we now free follow staunchly and mechanically, vainly imagining that there's virtue in following them staunchly, which makes up the mischief of following them mechanically. So we move beyond doing it because of habit to because we've been, had the best that's been thought and said passed on to us. We choose to do them because it's the right thing to do. So yeah, a whole gang of us on Twitter did this 500 words on the purpose of education thing. Um, we did it last May and the May before, and you know, I think it was my turn roughly about a year ago to write 500 words on what I thought the purpose of education was. And I managed to get it down to, what is that, six on the slide there. So I'd say, the purpose of education is about nurturing curiosity, about confidence, and about character. And I think some of that is very much about growth and resilience in the millennium. Thank you very, very much. Miles, I think that uh, MOOCs are a fascinating uh, possibility for uh, people to learn. And um, one of the things you said earlier was that what learners need, I think you're relating to school here, is the motivation to teach you that. And I have, until a few minutes ago, always assumed that somewhere along the line, we were going inevitably to need teachers to provide some of that motivation because it wasn't intrinsic 
and then you show me baby icon. <laughs> you know, if you can look into your crystal ball, is this going to radically alter the relationship between learning and schools and teaching? I think the motivation is going to be something which teachers or people are a lot like teachers are going to have to provide for an awful lot of children for an awful long time still to come. It's, if you are sufficiently, almost as I said, literate, connected, motivated, and have the time, then you're fine. The problem is the motivation might not be for everything which is worth your learning. There are many, many children who will teach themselves how to do incredible things on my on Xbox 360 games, or on this, that, and the other. But they won't sit down and learn the cello, and they won't necessarily go right or play a group, unless somebody is there encouraging them to do so. One of the things which we do as educators is broaden their horizons, which show them that there are other things worth being interested in, rather than just the things which are already interested in. Hmm. There are not these things interesting on this, because he says you know, it's about finding your element and pursuing that as far as you possibly can. That's very clear, and in many ways, in many occasions, absolutely the right thing to do. And I think primary education is too early just for focusing on, in, on the one thing that I'm interested in. I'd argue that secondary education is probably a bit too early for that too. It's, yeah, if the broad understanding and um, our future. And interestingly, on the MOOC point, Downs and Zinger were the people who pioneered the MOOC before Stanford and all the other big business universities got it with what they turned out ex -moots. They had a scene which was where loads of people who were interested in the idea was connected together and shared their thoughts on that idea. And that itself can be a much more motivating thing than sitting through and watching 18 hours of video from MIT Model. We were told that people do have to end the session now, and I'm sure that uh, Miles will be around uh, for a little while if we wish to talk to him. Can I just uh, thank Miles on behalf of all of us for taking us uh, from data to information and knowledge all the way to wisdom, and uh, contributing to our learning network and encouraging us all and our schools to connect.